Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Danny. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to really try and do this in five minutes without talking too fast. So um, this is a story I just want to share with you. Um, part of the story is about the hackathon, but there's also a lot in there about influencing and causing a lot of change in a big organisation. That's really what kind of focus I want to talk Sorry, to you about. Okay. So I just want to say, because there's all this buzz about startups and all this kind of thing, but working for a large organisation can be really, really cool. You know, I just think we need a shout out for large organisations. <laughs> it's like you get a large international online team. We get five million visits per week. Uh, we've got a suite of mobile apps, iPhone, iPad, Android, all this kind of stuff. We've got in-house teams and we've got the brand and the prestige. However, however, there's so much that could be better. And that's really the thing that I felt when I certainly came into the organisation. I was like, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm from our world. Well, we know what things can be like. We know how things can be. And it's like... How do you get a big organisation to see that? So it's sort of like the culture, the ways of working. I mean, we have shifted to Agile, but still really there's a lot of the organisation that, that hasn't moved in that mindset, the, the model of thinking, the, the, the innovation. It, it's not quite developed as it could be. Um, governance on time, this is a massive one for us. So any project work that my team do, it's all got to be approved. There's ser uh, various layers of, of management and approval and boards and all this kind of thing. And it's sort of like, if someone has an idea, what happens to that idea? Some guy on the floor is, he thinks something great. It's really hard to get that small idea right up to the top of the chain and get it developed by our team because we've got so much governance uh, sort of overseeing all the time. Um, it's not, our, our office isn't always the best setting for creativity and innovation. The, the seventh floor where the online department is, it kind of looks the same as where the account department is, you know? In terms of the, the way it looks, it kind of looks the same. Um, and, and our IT equipment, you know, we did just get out of Windows XP. We're on Windows 7, yay. <laughs> but it's sort of like, and I'm, I, I'm not being detrimental to John Lewis because I think it's probably the same in a lot of big companies. They have these huge IT infrastructures. It takes a long time to get that change. But for us, that's still a problem. You know, our customers are using, you know, whether they're using Windows 8 or Mac or Chrome or whatever. And it's like, we need to be catching up with them now. So it's a real kind of cultural shift that I'm trying to get in here. So how do you influence? So I, I mean, I'm UX manager. Uh, I manage a team about 10 people. From me to the top guy, I mean, there must be about 10 ranks up or something like that, several pay grades, you know? And it's like, how do I, how do I get to that guy at the top? Or how do I get to the layers just in between? that are the ones that are the real decision makers that actually enact change. So my kind of answer to that was that I needed to fix a business problem and also create a narrative. And, that, and that's kind of how I, I really began to sort of look at creating change in John Lewis. Um, so IT were actually running, this is all about timing, and IT, the directorate, was running a big pitch event. And they had this kind of concept where anyone in the business could pitch an idea and then they didn't quite work out what would happen when someone won. So I thought I might have an answer for them there. But because somebody, they had a huge, we went down to Google and lots of people pitched these ideas and somebody won, but it was sort of like, are we going to make their idea? Or it was a kind of the idea of a, a fashion advisor. Who's going to make that? And they hadn't really thought of that. And so I thought I might have an answer to their problem. Um, our competitors, you know, we're really acknowledging and John Lewis, it's a real, and I'm sure Marks and Spencer's and all the other lot are, Amazon are big players, you know, there's all these other competitors coming in and their culture and their ways of working are different to ours and it's sort of like if we're going to compete with them, you know, what can we do both, you know, externally from a customer proposition point of view but internally, how can we compete with that? You know, people come and visit our office and they visit, you know, uh, another, another competitor, they might kind of feel that really like what we're we offering them. So there's, there's a lot of sort of challenge there for us. And fortunate for me, there was a new online director uh, who had a real push for culture and innovation. So I felt the timing was quite ripe. Um, so I kind of created this narrative of how things should be. This was kind of what I ran through as I kind of, and I'll talk to you about the actual event that I ran, but this is the narrative that I wanted to run through it. So it was a great article in eConsultancy um, probably about so four months ago about post-digital working environment. I really like this post-digital thing because our office, if you look at it now, the screens have got thinner and, and, and the, the computer's got a little bit less taller, but it still looks the same. It's, it's, it's still a kind of pre-digital office. And it was really something, that a narrative that I wanted to start really spin and as a message to kind of give to the senior management team. The right equipment, so I've talked about some of that and, you know, have we got the right kind of PCs, Macs, whatever it is. Um, fast, lean models, you know, we have a lot of governance on our time and I was kind of like, how can we 
you know, how could we be different? How could we kind of make things really quickly? Um, and empowering teams to stretch their development and think like they've never done before, which is a real shift for John Lewis with so much kind of history of a waterfall development. How do we kind of like shift into this type of territory? Um, so, let's see. Oh, and great food. Yeah, that was another point. <laughs> <laughs> so, I ran this two years ago. Uh, this is the first John Lewis hackathon. Yay! This is my UX team. There's another half of them over here. I got them in a room in a dark, dingy day in a sort of training office, and we created uh, an app in a day in Exua, a clickable prototype. Took it, took it around the shops. People tried it out, and we presented it. And that was just a very loose model, but it kind of works. You know, th this is actually an app that y you know, whilst it's fake, it's an Exua prototype. You can kind of use through it. The users don't really know. It's a bit clunky, but it sort of works. And so I thought that might be something I can... What would it be if it was bigger? You know, what would it be like if it wasn't just a UX team making this? If we had designers, if we had someone from marketing, you know, how, how could it be bigger? So I sort of sat on that idea and then came along the Fashion Hackathon. So this is something that I combined with all those other bits of timing of this IT pitch, me doing a previous hackathon, and I kind of worked with IT to create this Fashion Hackathon idea. Now, they kind of Unfortunately for them, they kind of assigned me quite a lot of influence and power on this. So I started to shape it and make this bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where they couldn't really ignore it. And then I kind of got more and more autonomy the bigger it got. So I kind of set out the script for this uh, hackathon that we were running. So it was going to be 48 hours. We had an off-site post-digital location. So my emphasis to them was, I'm going to do a hackathon, but it has to be done the right way. And this will be a model for how John Lewis can do innovation in the future. So I kind of started to prescribe to IT, the, the department, like, and the business, how the hackathon will be is almost a model of how we could be. So um, three cross-functional teams. We had three working prototypes. We did omni-focused concepts, so really looking at how we can affect in-store as well as a mobile and all the different platforms. Um, we had partner experts in consultant booths, so different people around the business could be in booths on the day that we had the hackathon and people could go up and ask them for advice, so everybody felt involved. Um, we had real-time user testing on the second day. So we, we took prototypes up to the Cambridge store and we actually tested it with customers. These are prototypes that our design team had made in Exure and Flinto and, and all these sort of things the day before. So th this with John Lewis is totally like never, never been done before. Um, and then we had TV crews, they were just John Lewis TV crews, but it was still kind of creating that buzz and that vibe and really kind of getting people kind of excited. We had web pages and blogs, so we had teams of graduates blogging all the events so that everybody could see what was going on. So the whole partnership, as we're doing this hackathon, could, could uh, check in on the blog and be, oh, that's a good idea, and feedback to the teams. We had partner-wide interactive feedback. Final presentation was live streamed around the business. And then we, I even asked Xero to sponsor us, and they gave us you know, a fair bit of cash and free food. So it was, it was, quite, it was quite a nice little bit win. But all of this kind of momentum allowed me to basically get in front of uh, Andy Street, our MD, our IT board, which I think I've got on the next slide. Um, yeah, so I got to push my agenda. So that was, OK, we're doing hackathon, but by the way, I think this is how we should work generally. And so I got to do that through our online department, the IT board, and our MD of John Lewis. Um, and so that was a really good opportunity to get the audience that I wanted to get to, to speak to. And then finally, um, yeah, just to say that it was live streamed around the business, but the actual change that I managed to enact as a result of running this large event and then kind of, you know, harnessing what the narrative was, yeah, OK, it's a hackathon, but actually, by the way, this is really how I want us to work. So the, the change that I've kind of got, um, hackathon is now seems to be an accepted model of development by the business. It got a lot of interest. People were coming up to me and saying, we don't want to build anything, but we've got business processes that take six months to do. What if we just got all the people that do this business process in one room and didn't let them out for two days until they come <laughs> up with a process? Can we use the model for completely different things? And so it suddenly got all these kind of cogs turning. Um, we're actually, because I we haven't done hackathons with real developers, so I know it's a bit of a naughty word to say. It's really designathon. But now that we've got the IT infrastructure, we're looking at doing it with developers. So that's now an accepted model. Um, we're looking at integrating it into the Agile project workflow. I don't think I could have done that unless I'd have done this first. So now they've seen what's possible. They're like, hmm, maybe we can put it into a vision period or a spike, that kind of thing. So it's really like I've managed to kind of get this in now. And it's just sort of people are talking about it as if we've always done it, even though it was only the first time. And we might be doing several hackathons a year now. 
Um, and each time we're pushing the culture and boundaries whilst educating the business about innovation and UX. Um, and I think the final slide, that was just from the actual presentations that one of the teams did. Thank you.